And at 11, after an entire year, the Board of Supervisors approving a new Shasta Community Health Officer. An inside look at the very long Shasta County Supervisors meeting, the board discussing AB 969, more on the new regulations for hand counting voting. Progress in a high profile missing persons case, a Chico man behind bars. Details on the investigation, the North States News starts right now. Live, local, breaking, news you can trust. This is the North States News at 11. Good evening. Welcome to the North States News. I'm Ariana Martinez. Breaking tonight, the Reading City Council has appointed Captain Brian Barner as the new chief of police. A motion to have a second. second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Congratulations. We officially have a new chief. The City Council voted unanimously on Barner's approval earlier this evening. The Reading City Manager told us Barner has a long history with Reading law enforcement, adding his knowledgeable would benefit the community. Current Police Chief Bill Schruler will be retiring in November. The Shasta County Supervisors held a very long meeting starting this morning at 9, ending at around 6 this evening. During this time, several important discussions were made, including the hiring of a new health officer. James Moo was officially hired as the new county health officer. Moo has served as a medical professional for over 30 years. He is currently affiliated with Orville Hospital and Mercy Medical Center. Shasta County has not had a health officer since Karen Ramstrom was removed in May of 2022, after she advised the county to comply with health guidelines during the pandemic. The Fountain Wind project was unanimously approved earlier this evening. This project has been denied twice by the Board of Supervisors. Today, the board approved the project along with a media campaign with a budget of $100,000. The design phase to relocate the Veterans Service Office was also approved today. The board voting 4-1 to one to move the office from 1880 Shasta Street to across the street. Presenters say this will give the office more space and parking options. Anchor Mike Mangas was at a good chunk of the meeting today. He gives us a look inside the Board of Supervisors meeting. A lot of people sitting in and knitting in a response to County Clerk and Registrar of Voters, ROV, Kathy Darling Allen, knitting during the last meeting. You can act like I'm a lunatic because I don't like our ROV knitting during a board meeting. There was an agenda item to look at potential impacts of AB 969 on future elections. That's the law just signed by Governor Newsom severely limiting hand counting ballots. Conspicuous by her absence, Darling Allen was not there, but there was still plenty of opinions on the new law. The state needs to learn that it cannot change the rules in the middle of the game, and that's what they're trying to do with AB 969. I support Assembly Bill 969 because it protects us from stupidity, basically. We already do a partial hand count. Can we expand that hand count? Can we not find middle ground? Hand County has always been in place. You guys already know that. Obviously, nobody else does. I'm totally opposed to AB 969. It's basically legalizing machine cheating. This county is going to go bankrupt with Larry Curley and Mo up there because the fact is... Then when the discussion came back to the board, supervisors Kevin Cry and Mary Rickert got into a back and forth. I have not made a motion, nor have I second or voted for anything costing us any money pushing back on the state. Go ahead. It was triggered by our actions at this board. We have that law as a result of what's happened on this dais. Therefore, yeah, I'm not, I'm it's not, a not. cause and effect. This whole process for me has been watching the state's response to local control. Because again, and multiple speakers have said it, local control was the most important thing to me. And to see what the state did to take that away. I'm not going to go into any details today because my concerns, I wanted to speak directly to the Register of Voters. I think that's important. She's not here today. She didn't meet with us last week as well. This was not an action item, meaning no action was taken. The chair, Patrick Jones, said he'd like to bring it back at a time when Kathy Darling Allen could be there. 
On Monday, Congressman Doug LaMalfa, along with Mike Thompson, announced an extension of tax filing and payment deadlines in California for counties with a disaster declaration from December 2022 to July of 2023, moving tax filing and payments from October 16th to next month on November 16th. This deadline extension gives Congress additional time to pass Congressman LaMalfa and Thompson's bill, H.R. 4970, known as Protect Innocent Victims of Taxation After Fire Act, which aims to exempt all wildfire relief payments from federal income taxes. So what this enables us to do is hopefully get the bill passed out of the House or the Senate and over in time for um, people who are about to have to pay taxes. All the ones we're concerned about. So we need to be able to come out of this as best as possible. They're not going to come out whole anyway. LaMalfa says there are few steps left until the resolution gets passed into law. He says if he can't get it ironed out in the next month, then they will aim for another tax extension. It will then have to be passed by the House of Representatives, the Senate, then signed by the president to be made into law. More information can be found on our website, krcrtv.com. And now let's check in with First Alert Meteorologist Brian Schofield. Brian, yesterday it was cloudy and a little bit of rain. Today the sun was shining. It was warm. It was beautiful. And tomorrow more heat and even advisory level heat. Can you believe this? No. <laughs> no, no one can really. <laughs> well, the advisory is not for us. Take a look. It's definitely for a point south. Uh, but the Bay Area certainly, uh, as it looks like San Jose as well, some other areas, uh, in mostly inland valley areas, we'll see temperatures that could actually get to 100 Degrees. I know that even seems harder to believe, but truly uh, heat advisory once again in the shaded area, not here, but we've got 90s coming up. So they've got an even an elevated fire danger down to the south. And then you go closer to the coast and we're talking some big waves, some high surf. That'll also with an offshore uh, storm produce some sneaker waves. So never want to turn your back to the ocean. We simulcast there and so we really uh, find it important to give you a little heads up. Large breaking waves and that's all the way through coastal Mendocino as well. Nothing doing right now, just putting in some maybe patchy, dense fog in the overnight hours along the coast, but high pressure builds in nicely. And it's gonna make temperatures, really with clear skies, calm winds, look pretty good, pretty chilly too. Yeah, keep that uh, hoodie handy. Even though we're getting afternoon highs in the 90s, a big cool down will be on the way thereafter, along with a chance for some rain, and that's in your first alert forecast coming up. Reading police have arrested a Chico man in connection to the disappearance of a Reading woman who went missing in 2019. According to detectives, the case began back on December 8th, 2019, when Danielle Bushnell was reported missing to RPD by her boyfriend. Detectives learned on the same day she came into contact with 65 year old Eric Card of Chico at the 7-Eleven on Eureka Way. It's believed she was under the influence of drugs at the time. Card reportedly taking advantage of her vulnerability, convinced Bishnell to travel to Oregon with him, initially agreeing to bring her back to Redding. Reportedly, he changed his mind, becoming reluctant to take her home. Despite reports of Bishnell wanting to return home in time for her son's seventh birthday, she never arrived and has not been seen or heard of since. Detectives say there was substantial evidence, like video surveillance and photos discovered, linking Card to Bishnell's missing within the first couple weeks. It was work almost to exhaustion, uh, determined who she had finally left town with, because we didn't know. Um, so the work that goes into figuring out who she was with and where she was at um, just makes this a, made, made it a difficult case to work. So we finally were able to, uh, with the Siskiyou County uh, District Attorney's Office, um, it is our um, strong belief that that's the county where uh, Danielle was murdered and that her body's at. The investigation spanned across multiple states involving several law enforcement agencies. Card was said to have a history of befriending women who appeared distressed or under the influence of drugs and alcohol. The most recent report of this happening is the morning of October 10th, just hours before his arrest. He was charged with one count of homicide, currently being held at the Siskiyou County Jail. If you or anyone you know has had unusual or uncomfortable encounters with CARD, authorities are asking you to contact the Reading Police Detectives Division at the number on your screen. After the break, new details on the fire which broke out at a rice storage facility in Butte County. Next. 
First, here's a live look over Reading from our Hasselrood Law Skycam. Everything's looking calm right now. A look at our full forecast in just a bit. He was at the scene of a crash involving a school bus earlier today. CHP says the collision was in the Standish area near Johnson Road. Officials say this was a big rig versus a bus. No injuries were reported. The road was blocked for about two hours. It was then cleared up. A rice storage facility caught on fire this afternoon in Butte County. Take a look. This video was provided by Tony Connor on Chime In. Thank you, Tony, for sending this in to us. Cal Fire says this happened at the eight-story SunWest facility in Biggs around 3.09 this afternoon. Fire officials say crews made quick progress. The fire was in the fa facility's conveyor belt system. It was knocked down within an hour. Crews stayed on site to clean up for a few hours later. No injuries were reported. The cause is still under investigation. In Ohio, a judge sentenced a mother to six years in prison after two of her kids died in a fire. She pled guilty to involuntary manslaughter and child endangerment last month. Reporter Chelsea Sick tells us about the emotional sentencing, plus what the mom wants now. On September 17, 2022, I made a enormous mistake. It's been a year since Westchester mom Ashley Riles left four of her children home alone the oldest only six years old. Moments after she left, the apartment went up in flames. Two of her children died from their injuries. Tuesday, a judge sentenced her to six years behind bars. The rest of, of the community needs to know that if you engage in this kind of conduct, you're going to be punished too. Ahead of sentencing, defense attorney Alex Deardorff explains what led Riles to leave all four of her kids home alone. After working until one in the morning door dashing with her kids, she woke up and three of them were still asleep. She went to the store to get a drink and check her mail. She came back home to the fire at the Meadow Ridge Apartments. Judge Noah Powers says although it was an electrical fire, he considers Riles negligent. Even the most elementary of people know that you don't set up electrical cords in situations where they're going to cause fires. He said horrible housekeeping fueled that fire. She created a death trap here. Prosecutors say the surviving six-year-old is now in the custody of his paternal grandparent. The one-year-old is in foster care. Ryle's attorney asked the court to release her by next September so she can regain custody of the youngest before state law requires adoption. I'm not concerned about whether she's going to get these children back, quite frankly, because I don't think she should have them. The prosecutor dropped two additional counts of child endangerment against rallies in her plea agreement. She'll get credit for the nearly six months she's already spent in jail. Got some warmer days ahead. Oh, you better believe that. We're talking 90s. They don't last, but this week stays pretty warm no matter what. We're dry for now, but then that chance for showers increases. I'll show you what our chances here in the valley, a valley that has been missing out on those showers, coming up in your first alert forecast. When we come back, Shasta County announcing Teachers of the Year. Find out who's getting the special recognition next. Locals say river otters have been threatening their dogs on the Nurpon open space. On Facebook, a man says his dogs were attacked by otters while they were walking there the other day. Many people responding saying they've encountered otters before and now have to be cautious on the small river animals whenever they visit the space. The walking trail has become a popular spot for dogs with most visitors letting them run off leash, which is allowed at Nurpon. The Department of Fish and Wildlife wants you to understand river otters are common so it's a good idea to keep your dogs close. What I would say is they're really able to defend themselves. They're animals that move quickly, they can catch fish on the fly, uh, they have a lot of sharp teeth and they won't go after large animals because they can't eat them but they will protect their families and protect themselves from predators and from people. They're related to things like wolverines and badgers and so think of it like a really cute little wolverine of the water and you don't want to don't want to get on the wrong side of them. Since they have a tendency to move around, Jeff says you can encounter otters on land where they're even more defensive. It's best to watch them from a distance.
Now here's a live look at the Sundial Bridge tonight where hopefully there's no otters there. So we'll just hope. Is it an otter happen. free Sundial Bridge? I hope is that what so. you're thinking? I really okay. hope so. <laughs> the, the bridge is br shining bright tonight like the sun did earlier today. Uh -huh. So what can we expect <laughs> tomorrow, Brian? Well, hold on. There's a cute little Wolverine right there. Okay. <laughs> Take a look. Now see what's going on. Hey, look at these numbers from today. Wow. Uh, upper 70s is considered normal, and we were well above that. I mean, look, 89 Red Bluffs, 88 Redding. Uh, you know, the only holdout seems like uh, City of Mount Shasta right there, but I checked the gauge. That's, that's what it was saying there, so I hope it felt even better than that. But other areas, it makes sense. They were in the lower 70s, soon to be in the 80s, so plan on that. Plan on uh, some more 90s for tomorrow. We're saying 87 Oroville today, but 90s easily tomorrow. So just go out and enjoy. And once again, clear skies, calm winds. Get some patchy fog along the coast, inland not so much. If anything, we're going to stay uh, sunny, not even mostly sunny, we'll just call it sunny, and things will change up toward the end of the week. But in the meantime, with high pressure just nicely keeping anything high overhead, really in the Pacific Northwest, there's just nothing coming here. It's easy to show these kind of shots because it doesn't look like anything's happening, but that little stream will eventually make its way south, maybe not this one in particular, but we'll see everything pushed down to the south by the end of the weekend, and that's what will increase the chances for showers. Here's what the computer models are saying about that. Long range precision cast right there. Best chance to get a few showers would be in the evening hours, but that's along the coast on Saturday. So weekend starts really interesting and we go from 90s to dropping the numbers down back into the 70s for a spell with all that cloud cover added in. And then that moisture really starts to push into the valley uh, come by Sunday morning, let's say. So late Saturday starts along the coast, Sunday morning we get it. And we still keep it around through Sunday. It's a little unsettled, but then thereafter it starts to push out of the area and we clear out a little bit better for Monday. Rainfall estimates right there. You see that in Crescent City? Just kind of starts, a little tickle of rain there, not much going on. And then here comes some more along the coast, whereas every other area is just holding on to those zeros. There. So there's nothing registering just yet. But watch all of this push its way in, and that's through uh, early Monday. So keep that in mind. Uh, but uh, I think these numbers are certainly some high numbers. I could probably pop up a couple different rainfall estimate maps and they would say something different about the a half an inch in Chico, like it says right there. So uh, they don't always uh, hit the mark, but nevertheless, we know there is a chance and a better chance of getting some showers that we certainly didn't see last time in Chico. So upper 60s after some Apache dense fog for tonight, that's Thursday's upper 60s. And that means other areas are going to see those bigger numbers there too. You start seeing upper 60s in, along the coast, you know there's some 70s, 80s, 90s everywhere else, and then bringing in some of that rain. But here, let me give you an inland look. We don't always check in with the inland forecast, but there it is right there to near 90 degrees on Thursday, 70s for the weekend. 88 Weaverville for tomorrow. Good looking day. Go out and enjoy. Sit out on a patio. Just enjoy some conversation with a neighbor right there. 82 Fall River Mills, 82 Chester looking good. Hold on, maybe get out that grill. Maybe do that. Not warm enough to, you know, crack an egg on the sidewalk, but you get some coals going. I'll tell you that, you know, <laughs> see, I'm already planning tomorrow night work. Okay, 86 Ridley, 90 Orland. There you go. All right, so the next seven days thereafter, the temperatures do come down, but just enjoy this week, because this week, even without the 90s, we still look pretty good. So the weekend shows up, you see that moisture increase, obviously clouds on the increase, and a chance for a few showers there too. But notice overnight lows stay about where they should be once we get down into the weekend, even with things cooling down, we're so well above normal for the next few days that we'll get back to normal. Really, with afternoon highs and overnight lows, should be in the 70s and 50s. That's what we'll see as we get into next week. All right, back to you. Thank you, Brian. The Shasta County Teachers of the Year have been elected. The Shasta Office of Education is recognizing Heidi Garcia from Millville Elementary School, Wayne Randolph from Boulder Creek Elementary School, and Kenneth Howes from Fall River High School. This is through the California Teacher of the Year program, which celebrates the state's outstanding educators. Kenneth Howes was also selected to participate in the state's competition for Shasta County. Congratulations to all of the teachers selected. Your hard work is appreciated. The Halloween festivities in Humboldt will kick off this Friday with Griffin Locks Screamatorium Scaregrounds at the Humboldt County Fairgrounds in Ferndale. The North State's News Sophie Lincoln was able to get a sneak peek of the venue, which includes three haunted mazes. <laughs> For the third year, award-winning filmmaker Griffin Locke and his parents, Tondi Razuli and Robert McPeters, both producers, are bringing their Scream-atorium to Humboldt for Halloween. We take a lot of the story 
elements of my filmmaking. You know, a lot of the tools that we use in story, the storytelling of the films and kind of weave it into the stories that you're walking through in the mazes. This year will be the biggest venue yet, taking place at the Humboldt County Fairgrounds and featuring three different haunted mazes, live music, a beer and wine garden, a pumpkin patch, and more. We just outgrew the space that was available to us in Fortuna and luckily was granted access to the fairgrounds which I, you know, I truth, truthfully believe we will never outgrow because there's so much potential, not even here, but actually just in the town of Ferndale. Locke says he and his parents prioritized the storytelling aspect of the event, hiring real actors to play characters with intricate backstories that add to the stories being told in the mazes themselves. We're trying to make it its own world where if you want real Halloween fun, you come here and, you know, you totally forget about everything else just for a little bit because it just, it surrounds itself. The scare grounds will be open October 20th, 21st, 27th, and 28th, and of course on October 31st for Halloween. There are also special spooktacular events happening at the scare grounds on certain days within the two weeks preceding Halloween. For the full schedule of, of events or to buy tickets, visit our website, krcrtv.com. After the break, the IRS launching its own tax filing program. How soon taxpayers can use it. E-scooters may be causing more accidents than you think, plus United Airlines implementing a new seating system. How it can help make boarding easier. Time for big stories making local impacts. The Internal Revenue Service is moving ahead with a plan to build its own free tax filing program. Direct File is a pilot version available to some taxpayers next year. Eventually, the IRS tax filing system could serve as an alternative to private tax preparation companies like H&R Block and TurboTax. The IRS anticipates at least several hundred thousand taxpayers will decide to participate in the program. It will help the IRS determine whether it's feasible to offer a government-run tax filing system to more taxpayers in the future. Hospital emergency rooms are reporting big spikes in injuries related to electric scooters and hoverboards. According to a new federal report, injuries surged again from last year, more than 20 percent. In fact, injuries from e-scooters and e-bikes and hoverboards have risen about 23 percent each year since 2017. More than a third of the injuries during the six-year period involved kids 14 years and younger. There have been at least 233 deaths tied to the products in this time frame. Be careful if you're going to be riding one of those. United Airlines is introducing a new boarding process to help people get the window seat. In economy, people with window seats will board first, followed by those in the middle, middle seats. Passengers with aisle seats will board last. The airline says the system is similar to one it had back in 2017, just with more nuances. The new process allows pre-boarding, award tier and higher seat class customers to go first. Basic economy passengers board last. We'll be right back. Cal Fire gave a special presentation to a class of preschoolers. Check this out. Isn't that just the cutest thing? This video was shared by Reading Recreation. The little ones had a blast learning about fire suits, equipment, and inspecting a real life fire truck. They even got to use a hose, as you can see right there. I'm sure that little kid just made his day. These tiny, this was through the Tiny Tots program at Reading Recreation. Now, Brian, I was sharing with you earlier when I was in kindergarten, I remember doing the same thing, only it wasn't a little hose like that. It was the big ones that the firefighters had to hold. So I just remember it. Is that right? It was, it was a strong What one. are they using that little hose for anyway? Just for the example? It's not like to put out smaller... Okay, all right. <laughs> I think they did you wrong on that one. They just wanted to see what was going on. All right, uh, take a look. You know what? I'll take the show out of here. You know, let me just handle this. I got upper 80s, lower 90s checking in. A lot of sunshine for tomorrow. We've got 90s this week. It's going to be a nice warm week. Get out and about, and we'll see you tomorrow.